Hi, I'm Simon Drew, and you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to find more episodes of the show, as well as articles and information about my one-on-one alignment coaching, then you can head to my website. It's simonjedrew.com. If you do have the means to support the show, then I'd love to see you in my Patreon community. Just go to patreon.com forward slash simonjedrew, where you'll also get access to over 240 episodes recorded before 2020. But for now, enjoy the show. Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here and listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast. And in today's episode, we have a wonderful conversation with none other than one of my favorite repeat guests, Sharon LaBelle. Now, Sharon came on and did an interview uh, on the Practical Stoic Live platform, so we had a little bit of a discussion afterwards with some of my Patreon supporters, Uh, but if you want to hear that one, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash Simon J.E. Drew. Uh, but you're still going to hear the bulk of the interview today where we talk about some of these similarities between Stoicism and Buddhism. So, uh, look, you guys all know Sharon. You know that you can grab her book. It's in the link, uh, which is called The Art of Living, which is a wonderful translation of some of Epictetus's uh, greatest passages. So, uh, without any further ado, I present to you Sharon LaBelle. All right. So first question for you today, Sharon, I just want to ask, how are you? I am doing just fine. My heart aches for the world and living in the United States, my heart aches for my country, but I am doing perfectly well. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I think um, I think we can all agree that that's a, that's a similar feeling that a lot of us have. I mean, I I don't even live in America, but obviously I'm married to an American. She deals with it every day, um, and uh, you know, it's it's such a complex uh, web of problems that, that that America has to deal with right now. And uh, so, hey, all the more reason to talk about philosophy and Buddhism and all these good things. But, um, Sharon, I've been thinking about how I wanted to approach this interview with you because um, uh, obviously we've, we've talked a few times and uh, I feel as though the best way to approach this kind of conversation with, with you would simply to be a conversation around your experience with Buddhism, with Stoicism together Um, and I just, I just want to really hand it over to you and and allow you to tell us the story of, uh, I guess, how you first, um, yeah, came to understand what Buddhism was, um, and how you think that that uh, actually interacts with Stoicism. But when did you first, uh, actually find Buddhism and and what was it about it that, that kind of spoke to you so much? Well, uh, so I'm going to ask you if I get off into too many parentheses that you'll bring me, you'll bring me back. Cause it's okay, only- I'll, I'll try. We'll see. <laughs> but it started when I was 18 years old. I was at loose ends. I was living in Santa Cruz, California, and I saw a, a sign in a health food store that said uh, the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. And I thought, that's for me. So I got on a bus to Boulder, Colorado uh, to study with Allen Ginsberg. I was interested in poetry. Well, Allen was completely immersed in the world of Tibetan Buddhism. And at the time, uh, Boulder, Colorado was, uh, unbeknownst to me, a hub for uh, kind of the beginning of American style Buddhism. You know, mm. the, the peop- there was uh, representatives in the Zen tradition, Vipassana, but none of these traditions had really taken, you know, certainly 
there had been Alan Watts. There, there had been an interest in the 50s. But somehow it all came together in Boulder, Colorado. And I was young and impressionable. And I started, um, I, I got involved in what was then called the Naropa Institute. And I started meditating in earnest and learning as much as I could about Buddhism, um, you know, reading the sutras, um, learning about the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path. You know, when I look back on all that, I, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to even tell all this because I was so naive and I, I believe fiercely that the, I, I'm getting ahead of myself now, but I believe that the Buddhism that is practiced by Westerners, it, it's, it's valuable and it's not illegitimate, but it's so culturally eviscerated and kind of cherry picked that it, I, I, I may get some people mad here, but to me, it's more of a set of psychological techniques that have, or even life hacks in, in its mm. crudest sense. But anyway, I was very, very earnest and kind of cast my lot uh, with uh, this group of people. It wasn't cultish in any way, um, but it, it, there was definitely an in-group. Anyway, to this day, I have continued to practice uh, uh, both Zen and Vipassana style meditation. I don't consider myself a Buddhist. I, I think that kind of insults the, the world's people's, you know, I'm not a Cambodian. I'm not a Laotian. I'm not from India. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but but what I have always loved about Buddhism is that it's a practice rather than a creed. And I think that segues over to Stoicism, which I also see as being a practice rather mm -hmm. than a creed. Neither of the traditions is asking for you to have a membership card or to declare fidelity to a certain tribe. Um, so far as I know, you can't be excommunicated as a Stoic or a Buddhist. I'm, I'm working on that, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Fa founding Every Simon School of Stoicism where you can be excommunicated. Watch out, Jeff. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to touch on one thing that you said there. So, uh, when you say that you found Buddhism by way of a school of poetics, um, this is starting to make a lot more sense to me because I'm reading about the ancient philosophers of Greece and how, you know, so many of them were also poets and they would speak about the poets and these wonderful wordsmiths. Um, what, what, what was poetics in this school what does it mean how did it lead to buddhist teachings like what is poetry as it pertains to buddhism the, to tell you the truth i don't feel qualified to answer that i can i can report my own very particular experience but i'm not sure it has i i i couldn't uh, generalize it, it would be just intellectually dishonest of me to generalize mm. from my experience what I was immersed in although I do think there was an authentic Buddhism happening in Boulder and an authentic poetics the larger container, the larger vessel of all of this was really the 1970s. And um, so, for example, the many of the people who were part of this school of poetics 
were, they were beat poets. And so there was Gregory Corso and there was, you know, the crazy literary renegade, William Burroughs and Anne Waldman. I don't know if these names mean anything to anyone anymore, but these people were trying to push the envelope of what it meant to be human through words, definitely through words and through using words in ways that shocked and startled people out of habitual patterns of thinking or behavior. So I guess I'm kind of circling around your question, but um, it seems that the spirit of this particular place and particular time that I found myself in, which was so formative, uh, it was animated by uh, questions about everything we took for granted, what we thought were eternal verities. Uh, my, to call them colleagues would be <laughs> grandiose, my <laughs> compatriots, uh, we were all just questioning what is valuable? How do we be human beings? Um, where does morality fit into all of this? Or are we just, uh, you know, is value and morality relative? You know, that was part of the conversation back then. But to move up the timeline to now, um, so I'm, I'm still involved with the Vipassana tradition. I actually live in, in, in this little bitty town I live in. It's, uh, our one big industry, so to speak, mm -hmm. is um, the Spirit Rock Meditation Center. <laughs> and we produce meditators. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I would say there's a, a, a love of, of words in, in, in the sense of seeking a, a precision of meaning in imparting wisdom. Uh, have I gone completely off the rails there? Anyway. No, you, no, you absolutely. <laughs> What's your question? Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it could, I, I've been really fascinated by that is the, yeah, that, that tradition of, uh, you know, wrestling with morality via words and, and, and poetry. And, and it just seems like that's something that has been, uh, almost uh, detached from philosophy, whereas it used to be hand in hand. You know, it used to be, they used to be partners, poetry and philosophy, right? Yes. Hmm. That is so interesting. Uh, boy, when we ring off, I've... <laughs> Right about this. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it just it se it seems to me like poetry is almost the blanket behind which the philosopher hides himself, so that he doesn't have to face the world uh, as a teacher, but he faces the world as an artist, right? So it's like with music, right? Like if you listen to music intently enough, and if you know what to listen for, you will hear the philosophy of the music. Uh, but they're not actually telling you this is how you should live. They're just presenting it to you in a way that hides them from the responsibility of, of, of actually telling you that. Does, does that kind of make sense? Or I, I'm sure it would to you. But Oh, yes. It's, well, if, I, I mean, I take your words to mean that such communication as poetry or music are meant to indicate, to point mm. to, to greater truths. And it's kind of like you say, people are either listening for those truths um, or they're just hearing it as something background, pretty, or they're just reading poetry maybe at the surface level or or digging a couple layers deep but not not going down to roots all of which are reasonable ways to mm. relate the text to relate 
to a constellation of sounds. I like to think that all of life speaks, it, it, you know, that I, I hope I don't sound like a lunatic, but that if you're paying attention and you're in front of a tree, the tree speaks, the, mm. the poem speaks, the music speaks, and it just depends on how much we're paying attention. Or maybe even another way to say it is how much we're willing to be in relationship with that which we encounter. Mm. Well, that that actually makes a lot of sense to me, what you just said there, because, I mean, <clears throat> I think back to something that one of my previous guests said, uh, I don't know if you know of Stephen Jenkinson, <clears throat> but he, he told me in, in his interview, <clears throat> excuse me, he said that poetry is found, uh, I, I believe, I'm going to paraphrase this, but he said poetry is found in the handle of the shovel. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. Even just in that, yeah, it's like that, I, I can't even begin to understand that yet, but it's it's similar to what you're saying. Every single thing is poetry, art, teaching, you know, guiding information through it. Um, yeah, you're right. We're definitely going down a, a path where people could perceive this to be extremely woo-woo. And that's fine because <laughs> cause I trust you that this is, you know, uh, of course this is all good, true stuff. And, and if you do pay attention, I've absolutely found that. I've found that if you pay attention, things will, will offer lessons to you if you will receive them. Yes. Hmm. It's, I think another way to say paying attention so that it doesn't even sound so school marmish, like, are you paying attention, Simon? Wake up, wake up. Are you paying? I think of it as kind of um, like daring to care. Hmm. Daring to care. You know, what, what if we treated this moment, this encounter, this, this poem, this standing at a traffic light as not being some temporary in between to the more important stuff or to our destination, but rather we dare to care right now. That's kind of, I don't know, that, uh, that's an experiment in truth, uh, or, or mm. a kind of half-baked idea. Mm. Uh, but, I, I, and kind of to be fair to this uh, advocacy <laughs> I find myself <laughs> doing, you know, dare to care. Um, I, think, I think we all feel a lot of caring fatigue also um yeah given the actual world we live in right now hmm. we can just get so tired of being um engaged fully engaged with um just the catastrophes that abound hmm. I still think caring is worth it. I still think it's worth it. I don't think that your categorization is is wrong. I think that that's absolutely the case with many people is that there is so much to care about and there are so many people telling you what you need to care about and there are so many things that you want to care about and you hop on Facebook and all you're bombarded with is things that you should care about. <laughs> <laughs> And you listen to a podcast and they pointed out to you that there's so many things that you could, should care about. <laughs> but but it's, it's so true. There's so much to look at, but um, you know, okay. So Buddhism. Buddhism. Yes. So what are some of the core ideas of, of, of Buddhism? Like I've written down here. There's obviously the four noble truths. Um, I've learned about the middle way. Um, could you explain to us maybe the four noble truths or, or the way, actually, no, just explain to me the way that you see Buddhism. Cause I know that you've given me, you, you've told me that, you know, there's kind of the American Buddhism. Um, you know, I, I think that it takes on a different flavor no matter where it goes. Um, but 
what is Buddhism to you? What have you gained from it? Well, the, the Four Noble Truths are pretty terrific in, in their simple observation. Simple, but so important observation that life is suffering in the sense of, uh, you know, the term dukkha, uh, that the problem is our, our craving hearts and minds. Um, and I, I've just observed that to be true. And what Buddhism purports to offer, and I think it delivers the goods, is a, a way of, of seeing that craving, that, um, that out of control desire on our part to have things be the way we want them to be. That there's, that through a, following a moral co code, excuse me, and embracing a contemplative life that steps back, not monastically, but just on a, on a daily basis through practicing, call it mindfulness or um, call it what you will. Uh, Oh, you've just gone away. I think you may have covered up. Again. So sorry. I don't even know where the little dot. I don't think anybody there. knows where the where the microphone is on any computer. <laughs> it As you were. What I said. I was just mumbling. <laughs> uh, golly, I lost my train of thought. But anyway, um, I. I forget the question, but what we're talking why, about, uh, yeah, the truth of suffering, that. the cause of suffering, the end of suffering. Yes. Yes. And those, those principles, they, the eightfold path, you know, uh, right speech, right effort, right, right this, right that. Uh, I, I'm not saying that in a trivializing way, but I want to get to uh, my greater point, which is, all of that is meaningless on the page. You know, anyone can just say, and these are the main beliefs of Buddhism, and this is, and you know, and oh, Buddhism's, B Buddhists are concerned about the, they notice the um, transitory nature of existence. All true, but the important thing is, did you practice today? And I suppose, you know, hopping over into the other lane, that's, that's the same thing with Stoicism. You know, you can, you can read a bunch of aphorisms called from Marcus Aurelius or from Seneca, Epictetus, you know, name your Stoic. But it doesn't mean anything unless you're doing something about it. And the beauty, I think, of these two traditions is that they're doings, their practices, rather than uh, a list of thou shalts and thou shalt nots, or, you know, have we angered our deity today? You know, is our deity going to, um, you know, judge us harshly? Uh, and then, um, you know, that's not paid attention to. It's what are you doing to, you know, both traditions are asking us, we hear that this word all the time so that it's almost become meaningless, but it's still a good word. They're both asking us to cultivate the better part of ourselves. To me, that's good stuff. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, and you know, what's, what, what I'm really hoping to get out of you, which we have already got so much of is, is your experience 
through Buddhism and, and Stoicism? Because at the end of the day, anybody can look up, you know, what are the four noble truths? Or what's the middle way? Anybody can find these things at the touch of a, you know, touch of a phone um, in a second. Uh, but, you know, when I think of somebody like you, Sharon, um, and, and I promise that this this compliment will have a, a point. It's not just going to be in vain. Um, so uh, Seneca has this beautiful quote where he says that first you must judge a person and then you trust them, right? And and I, I've I've really judged you as a person who uh, not only has understood these philosophies, these uh, you know, of Buddhism or Stoicism, whatever you have understood, but you have embodied them, right? And you seem to me as somebody who if I was to look at all, all the people who I speak to and say, well, who, who's the person who has most embodied what I want to be and what I want to embody, it's somebody like yourself. You have a peace of mind around, around you. You have a, um, a certain, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why, you know, this interview, we have, we have so many people here to, to, you know, ask questions of you. It's because you, you give off a sense of you've embodied something. It, it's, it's within you, Right. And that's what I'm really interested in. And I'd like to know, you shared with me a story once of uh, when you went to, I, I believe, live with some monks or some meditators. Um, yeah. And you just mentioned then that um, Buddhism is great, but it's not necessarily for the monistic sort of life. Um, could you share that story with me again, just so that everybody can hear it? Because I think that it was really important to transition into the middle way of Buddhism. Boy, I hope I'm thinking of the same one as yours. Is, is it the one where I lived with the Cistercian nuns? Yes. In- <laughs> <laughs> You're one of the few people in the world who can say a sentence. Uh, is it the story where I lived with the Cistercian nuns? <laughs> <say> <laughs> um, prime the pump for me, Simon. I, I forget. I forget what I told you about that. That I think uh, the general point was uh, you you came to an understanding after spending time with, with with these meditators, these monks, that that secluded lifestyle was not necessarily the way. At least to you, to some people, it was. But to you, you felt as yeah. though you needed to be back in society, like the Stoics say, it's like we're social creatures. So come back and yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, danger of me getting on a soapbox now. Uh oh. I, ooh, you better muzzle me. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it was wonderful living at Remove from society, from my household, for that matter. Uh, it, it, this particular instance, I was writing a book with a Benedictine monk named Brother David Steindlerast. And so because I hadn't come from the Catholic tradition, um, I, I felt like I should, you know, have some direct experience of what we were even talking about. And so I lived at this monastery, uh, which was uh, quite self-sufficient. They grew their own food, and it was very beautiful. It was just every day was peaceful. It was beautiful. Poetry abounded. The birds sang. It was great. But to me, that environment bless all the hearts of the people who were there. They were some of the finest folk I have ever met in all my life. But, you know, it's pretty easy to be a cool cat when you're, <laughs> you know, when you don't, you know, I, I raised six children, okay? I raised six children. They're all adults now. And someone who is celibate, and hasn't had to work a job they weren't in the mood to go to at 7 a.m. You know, tell me something I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's all kinds of ways to be a human being. But I think, 
I think you need this. I'm not going to say it's for everyone. And it's certainly great to take a retreat from life, whether it's 20 minutes to meditate each day or to go off on a silent retreat. It, you know, may all these practices flourish. And yet, the person I want to learn from is the person who is dealing with, you know, a really annoying coworker every day or the fact that they're uh, uh, infertile and they really want to have a child or that they're living in poverty and trying to scratch out a life. Um, that's, to me, that is the locus of meaningfulness. Hmm. But I have my biases because I pushed out a whole bunch of children into the world and ended up having to live with the consequences. So, yeah. Well, yeah, you know, I, th I think that that story for me really, um, it showed me that you have embraced the yeah the, the middle way of buddhism um you know because then you you with it even within buddhism you then have say zen buddhism which uh, i mean many people uh, do take that as a call to to meditate as their their ultimate practice and um to be in seclusion um and but but for you you said i have to be around people and lots of people. And, and that was also the way of the Stoics as well was, you know, Zeno kind of, he learned from the cynics, these people who were just living on the street, you know, had nothing, <laughs> wanted to be away from people. And, um, but, but then he said, well, you know, there's probably something more to this. Like maybe we don't need to be so detached from the regular way of life. And then what, what I have found uh, reading up until Seneca, um, you know, you find that Seneca says things like, uh, you, know, you know, we should we should certainly be different from the mob, uh, but they should still understand our life, right? So, so they should still yes. be able to understand us. Yes. Yes, because if we lose all intelligibility to our fellow humans yeah what's the what's the point and i say that as a myth a mythanthrope a myth <laughs> i have please explain I, exactly what that means i mean it's like someone who's not keen on being around people but i, I <laughs> how fitting of you to choose a word that people wouldn't understand no i'm just kidding <laughs> right <laughs> See the poet hides behind the words, but uh, yes. but, but no, I I agree, and 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 you know I think that we we share this. Sharon is is there's when you love philosophy, it's almost as if philosophy can sometimes call you a little bit too closely, and and even Seneca talks about, and I think that I think that most of the Stoics have talked about this. Throw away the books, right? Like Marcus Aurelius yeah. says throw away your books, realize what you are. Right. And I, you know, I sit with like books all behind me, but, and I'm trying to read as many books as I can right now. But, but I think that the idea is even reading and learning and principles that you're studying can become uh, almost too much and they can get in the way of you actually seeing the major point of what you're supposed to be learning. Um, and and you can think that life is supposed to be about learning and, and gain, gaining wisdom, but wisdom lies in the everyday interactions like we've talked about in the past. Uh, it, wisdom is the mechanic who does, does a superb job on your car and you drive away feeling as though you've had value for money and, and there's been a good interaction. Wisdom is the advice that a parent gives to you know, a son or a daughter that changes their life. You know, can, can you speak to that, this this need for people to sometimes put down the books and focus on, yeah, how am I practicing this? Well, my first thought, best thought about that is to, again, return to the Buddhist side of the street. Mm. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about before we had this conversation is 
you know, really what are the differences between Buddhism and Stoicism? Not so much, in, you know, obviously they have different origin stories, di different, uh, they came, uh, different uh, cultural taproots. But it seems to me that um, at least how I have tried to practice Stoic principles, I, when I have my Stoic hat on, so to speak, I am seeking wisdom, whether it's it, through books or through active rational examination of my, my behavior, my words, my deeds, my thoughts. In Buddhism, rather than seeking wisdom, it's more like finding wisdom or wisdom finds me mm. through meditation, through listening, through daring to care. Um, you know, maybe it's just semantics, two sides of the same coin. You say tomato, I say tomato. I don't know. But somehow that difference seems significant to me. It's, it's a, the, the two traditions seem to be kind of animated by a different aspiration even if what you get on the other side of your interaction with these key ideas may be the same thing. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I like the categorization of, of, you know, one, because the Stoics do really, their whole philosophy is based around this idea that we tap into our rationality, our reason in order to uh, understand logos. ourselves in the world. Logos. Excuse me. Logos. Right? That's it. The logos. logos and versus Dharma. Logos. Yep. Versus... Okay, sorry. sorry. So, so Dharma, what is the connection between Dharma and the logos? I think one could make a very convincing argument that again it's tomato tomato it's mm. there are different ways of referring to the same thing um that said um where'd you oh there you are simon hi oh, uh, <laughs> somehow, somehow my computer started um shuffling people um Oh, shoot. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Logos, oh, Dharma. There we go. <laughs> Logos, Dharma. Logos, Dharma. Well, Logos reduces to the word. Word. Reason. Dharma's the way. Dharma's the way. See, I have no answers here. I, I only mm. have questions well in some ways it's a, it's it's it, seriously like I, I agree i only have questions for this because it's the i'm trying to understand what the logos is it seems to me like the logos is simply the word that western culture has used to describe our portal through to better wisdom that is that is not yeah. and it might be that that dharma is that same way it, it, it's yeah it's the way to receive wisdom that maybe you haven't necessarily sought for but you simply have it within you uh or or without you <laughs> you know um I, I have no idea but it's it's all interesting to theorize um but 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 this is something that i'd like to talk about as well is is these exercises you've said you've talked about your meditation um various exercises that you've done without making it to see it's called the practical stoic podcast but at the end of the day i don't want it to be so practical that we lose sight of the beauty of these principles and just end up becoming a rigid practicer of these things but um 
what are some of those exercises that you use in order to help you to tap into Dharma or the Logos or um, whatever you're trying to get out of Stoicism or, or Buddhism? Well, every day um, I, I, I practice yoga every day, which I consider not separate from Buddhism or Stoicism, but that's a whole other story. Mm. Um, so I, when I get up each morning, I practice yoga for at least a half hour. I try for an hour if uh, time and life will permit. And then I close my eyes and I watch my breath, or rather, like any meditator, I try to watch my breath. And what that does is it settles my mind. And just for me, a settled mind brings me closer to the possibility of a clear mind. Um, I'm less reactive uh, as a consequence. I, I don't find it so necessary to convince other people that I'm right about something. Um, and doing this makes me uh, more patient with uh, others or the state of the world. Uh, it reminds me that there are that basically I don't understand anything that's going on so that I should sort of shut my trap and listen and be respectful and do the best I can to be some kind of agent of love and usefulness to other people during the day. As to the stoic side of things, at night I, uh, I have a little journal and I, I just do a kind of character review. It's, it's not very systematic. It's, it's pretty idiosyncratic, but it's just a way to keep on, on track because I have, I, I guess this is also a statement of why I was attracted to stoicism. I find that my effort to be a good person is what makes my life good, that those are one and the same, that a virtuous life is, um, is a happy life or a meaningful life. Yeah. And I think that what this speaks to, uh, Sharon, is that a lot of these religions, philosophies, ways of life, they're all aiming at the same thing. You know, I remember something that uh, Malcolm X once said in, in a court hearing. I think he said something like, um, you know, it seems to me like I'm praying to the same God that you're praying to. It's like if I'm praying to the God who made the universe, then it's the same God that the one that you're praying to is Christians. It's just we call it a different name. And when it comes to philosophy, we're all aiming at some sort of peace of mind, some sort of better way of being, character development. Um, what the Buddhists use meditation for, the Christians use prayer for. What the Christians use prayer for, the Stoics use evening journaling for. It's all aiming at the betterment of the soul, right? Trying to become something more than what we are right now. And, you know, I, th I think that, this whole conversation has just been so gorgeous so far. I want to thank you for sharing the wisdom. And I know that we've got a fair few people here keen to ask a question. So I think now might be a good time to duck over there and see who, who wants to jump in. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to sign up for email updates, join my Patreon meetup groups that we hold weekly, or if you'd like to offer feedback or suggestions for future guests or topics on the show, then you can head to simonjedrew.com. There you'll also find information about how we can work one-on-one -on -one together with my alignment coaching, based around the philosophical principles found in Stoicism. Finally, if you are on Facebook, then I'd love to see you in our group, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. 
But hey, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I'll talk to you next time.